This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I love reading Megan all, uh, constantly on the technology channel of our site. She always has the freshest and most surprising things to say. Thank you. I didn't even pay him to say that. Thank you. No, <laughs> it's just so good. And you've, you've all been enjoying Megan's uh, considerable moderating skills over the past two days. And I get to lead off and co-moderate with Megan, which we're both thrilled about because we're both so interested in these panelists. And then I will be the second rude East Coaster to get up and go to the airport and say, what are you doing living three hours behind us and not giving us any nice afternoon <laughs> flights we can take? So I'll apologize in advance for that. But <clears throat> we all want to know how to live better, longer lives. And in fact, I think we want to know how to live better lives while we're living them at every moment that we're living them. But today we will be talking about longevity. <clears throat> and we're going to start with Larry Smarr, who's the director of this very uh, building, this very institute we're in. And he was just telling me that he, following the wave of the future really, gave up his imperial suite and took a small <laughs> office right here on the ground floor to be right among the researchers. And could you start framing some of the idea? I hope that you've all read last June's article in The Atlantic by Mark Bowden. Uh, which called Larry, I think, the most measured man. He is the most measured man. <laughs> every part of his biome, every part of his body, every biological process is constantly moderated. He has literally laid it open <laughs> for analysis. It's kind of, he's the open source professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> in every way open source. But some of the things you've discovered give us a lot of insights into how we should be thinking about uh, the choices we make in our own lives. But you, could you lead us through that curve you were telling me about from birth? Right. I mean, the question is, who is us? You know, it's a, it's a plural. Um, we uh, are born basically uh, with a sterile gut, um, and we inherit the mother's microbiome on the way out one way or the other, vaginal or C-section, which makes a big difference in what happens. And then that uh, diversity of the microbiome, which is 90% of all the cells in your body, ultimately, um, grows very rapidly. It boots up your immune system, trying to figure out friend from foe of the microbes. At the same time, your brain is very rapidly developing. And, and, and those three are very highly coupled systems until, as you continue to uh, age, you reach middle age, and then as you go down this long period of older life, all along there, your body's central systems are changing. And so you have to understand what those systems are. You have to understand that you have 100 trillion microbes along with your 10 trillion human cells. Uh, and that when you interact with the environment, like what you eat, whether you exercise, all these other things, it's not just affecting your human cells, it's affecting all of these microbes. And the only real way I can see that we can learn to age gracefully is first to take personal responsibility for your body, its state, and its future. No one else is going to do it for you. And that's very counter, very, very counter to our culture. And we could get into why that has developed. Mostly it's follow the money, and you can figure it out. Um, but in any case, 
there are tools that science is developing, and we're going to hear a lot of other things here, but what I've been involved in is how can we take the tools of science to understand longevity? And we've got things like Eric Topol you heard last night. He's now sequenced the human DNA of 500 of what are called the welderly, the people have aged very well. Have you all got long. that term, and why haven't we been using it all the time? The welderly. Hmm. And... and um, uh, Karen Nelson, who's the president of the J. Craig Venter Institute, has just announced last week a new project that will start uh, sequencing uh, all of the microbiome in you, the rest of your DNA, not just the human, and the omics, the, we've heard proteomics, metabolomics, and so forth. In other words, the, the catalog of what, who you are and how that changes over time, but then also how it compares across populations. So these, it's, a, it's a moment of discovery of us that is a once in centuries moment. And isn't one of the things you're discovering that there's this symmetrical development curve? You were talking about the enormous uh, upward change in, I hope you didn't mean upward and downward, you were just referring to rates of change. In the first few years of life that establish the microbiome, the body systems the way they are, and then an enormous amount I didn't even want to ask, starting at what age, an equal rate of change, starting at what age, and what are some of the changes we should be thinking about in reaction to those? Right. I mean, I, I'm 65 in another week or something, so I'm just old enough to maybe be part of these studies. <laughs> uh, you have every intention of being welderly, do you not? Uh, well, if I could do as well as she has, no I, will be, I will be. Let's just get very, that right out of the way. Very fortunate. Uh, it's, it's not easy, but we're learning so much more about it. And I think, of course, as a member of the baby boom generation, we have transformed this economy all the way from hula hoops to the Vietnam War protest. Uh, all the way through, and we are now about to make one of the biggest changes, which is as we become the elderly majority of this country, uh, you are going to see everything shift to focus on aging. So um, you were talking about some of the rational changes that we can all make which have to do with exercise that you've already been making. Uh, changing your diet, you were saying to eliminate all, you know, what I don't want to hear, which is refined sugar. That's the last thing I wish to eliminate. Get rid of it. And <laughs> refined flour and eat everything that's organic and locally raised, which is something that Deborah Seke has been telling people to do and enacting and helping thousands and thousands of people do for decades. Uh, she has advocated so many of the changes that you are saying make sense and will keep us all welderly as an entrepreneur. Uh, she's been an entrepreneur, was it 16 or 17 that you started? It was 18 <laughs> that you actually started a, a pay your own way kind of camp in Mexico that actually taught wellness and showed people the health benefits of eating food and helping raise it and understanding it. All the things that are now in fashion were so uh, farsighted and available to people because of Deborah and her Rancho La Puerta, did you just email me in another context today, was voted the Travel and Leisure's Reader's favorite destination spa? World's best overall. World's <laughs> best overall. Let's just get that straight, the world's best overall. And that's entirely a creation of Deborah. So can you talk about some of the resistance that you saw to exercise, but also you were saying something about the importance of change. And you're going to be talking about that. And I just have to preface this by saying, when I recently ran into Alice Waters, whom you all know, and another uh, pioneer of the organic movement, they said, as almost everyone who mentions Deborah says, as I was hearing, just I hear it all the time, she's my role model. Mm -hmm. And the reason Alice said it was, she changes her life every 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so there are many things we'll be hearing about today to do with exercise and public, uh, public efforts and governmental efforts to change exercise. But uh, the refreshment of the body as well as of the spirit. Uh, I represent the subject <laughs> because I'm 91. And it's no different than being 61 <laughs> if you do the right things. And I probably tried to do the right things. But I wanted to bring up, 
First, it's an absolute no-no to read statistics. But these are so interesting, and they're important for you all to know. And so I'm going to read them. And I have to remember <laughs> to keep the mic up. In a matter of 60 seconds, about the amount of time it will take you to read this page, your body will perform millions of complex functions, quietly, automatically, flawlessly. You will take about 15 breaths. Your heart will beat 70 times. Your tear ducts will moisten your eyes 25 times. Six million chemical reactions will occur in your brain. Your bone marrow will produce 180 million blood cells and destroy the same amount. You will shed 10,000 particles of skin and 300 million cells will die. Over and over throughout your lifetime, your body will work countless mini miracles to keep you breathing, moving, thinking, and living. And that's really what's important. It's where you live and you need to get to know where you live. And we happen to be in total harmony on that subject. Uh, it, but the whole awareness of the body and its ability to heal itself, it's been doing it for millennia. I mean, the body does its job and it says, let me do my job. I, let me do my job. I know what to do. Uh, and we don't. And we interfere with it. And so much of the over-counter pharmaceuticals interfere more with the body's functions because it's so finely tuned. It's doing all those things all the time. Does this have to do with your very early advocacy of uh, organic food, the idea of don't let other people contaminate or f interfere with the way your food is raised? We've done organic gardening now. Ranched on 1940, <laughs> before the war. And uh, we were called a cult. Uh, $17.50 a week, week, bring your own tent. And the idea of n not introducing foreign substances, substances that are not organic and natural. And so organic gardening was obvious because, and that continues in all things, and I'm anti all boxes, bottles, and cans in people's kitchens. We do everything from scratch, and it's worked. And also, you were early on to the idea of exercise. It made a huge amount of money and a huge impact in the Golden Door, but it was an outgrowth, really, of your feelings about body and spirituality and, and not just a pragmatic weight loss regimen, no? It's always been. Passion and spirituality and life and all the excitement. In other words, why do you want to work so hard with your body being well? Because you want to be able to do everything, think everything, uh, be curious. Uh, the vitality of the food, of your exercise, of your health has to do with your vitality of your mind and your curiosity. Have you watched attitudes about exercise change? Because you helped, what was the name of the council that you led in Washington about exercise? Oh, that was way back. Yes, way I back, <laughs> way back. We were talking 1940. Way back. <laughs> I did the. In was the it Nixon, the 70s? In the Nixon White House, I did the keynote address on fitness. So that was a little while ago. <laughs> and yet, you were bringing it to awareness in a country that was resistant. Are, do you feel? I mean, you live in. What is it that us horrible, lazy, sluggish East Coasters see when we get off the plane in San Diego? Everybody running. From the minute I got out of the airport yesterday, there's a path by the airport, semi-naked people running. And then where, wherever we are. So I would say, have you seen a change? But you're in the epicenter of the change. When you travel to many other parts of the country as you do, do you find that people exercise more regularly and compare it to even the recent past? Every decade, Americans who read, who've been educated, do more and more. Unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily trickle all the way down. Mm -hmm. And so the people you're seeing, and they, you know, it's, it's this uh, zip code thing. The poor people don't get that message and the, because they don't read and they don't listen. And all of you should be running and exercising and doing all those things. And most of you do, because you, I hope, educated you're here. <laughs> and the importance of exercise, of oxygen to the body. The body requires great gobs of oxy oxygen 
The mind does, the butt, and particularly the brain. And there's a lot of studies that is linking dementia to lack of oxygen. There's actually some studies that even Alzheimer's is increased by lack of oxygen, the pacing of Alzheimer's. So you all have a cure, and it's do what he's been talking about, all that walking, all that exercise. Uh, yes, and uh, what you've been doing with your farming with Rancho La Prada, with this enormous paradisal <laughs> spread I keep hearing about, um, and looking at pictures of, is you've been helping all those, how many trillion, 90 trillion guest cells that we have in our body? 100. 100, because <laughs> 100 trillion. don't our eating choices affect the microbiome very much? And so uh, what Larry was saying before is that we're starting to understand a huge composition of not just what we've been thinking are the body cells, the 10 trillion, but also that extra 100 guests. And, <laughs> and you at Rancho La Puerta and the influence you've been having are helping people to make the entire body more of a coherent organism. Uh, the we, the us of our body that Larry talks about. Megan, did you want to lead us into sure. the next section? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so yeah, let's talk about that idea of, of sort of a holistic approach to the body, and especially this idea of exercise as it relates to the brain. Um, to my left is Kunal Sarkar, who is the co-founder, excuse me, founder and CEO of Lumosity, which is the Internet's leading brain training um, organization. And you have 40 million users. For 40 million users as of... Uh, the middle of this year. Which is awesome. And also leads to a lot of data um, and a lot of ability to sort of you know, track trends about how people use their brains and what things are especially beneficial. So could you tell us a little bit about what you've been finding? Yeah, no, this, is, uh, this has been an exciting, uh, I guess, uh, almost eight years now. We started back in 2005 um, with this idea that uh, we could take some of the learnings in labs um, around creating tools that can you know, basically, activities that have been shown to improve types of cognition and, and creating tools that people can actually use. And I think when we first went out and started talking to people, um, investors and those types, and I think people kept asking, well, how many people want to do this kind of thing? And I was like, well, I don't know. Nobody does it now because the tools don't exist, but it feels like the kind of thing that all of us ought to want to do. I mean, I certainly want to do this. Uh, everybody in my family wants to do this. Um, so, yeah, over the um, but we had this vision that if we built the tools, people would be excited, and a lot of them would use it. And once a lot of them used it, we would have a, more data about the brain that, that you know, than has ever existed. I mean, typically, you know, like things like IQ tests, those are normed, they're normed for, with like thousands of people. You know, 4,000 people is a large data set. You know, um, today, as, as Megan mentioned, we have 40 million users. So, you know, fast forward, I guess, seven years. Um, and now we have this data set we can start asking really interesting questions of. You know, it's not, you know, it doesn't sort of tell you all the answers, but it really helps you create interesting hypotheses um, and points, you know, research in interesting directions. So some examples of things that we have been uh, looking at. Um, actually, there was uh, maybe about three months ago, there was a paper in Frontiers of Neuroscience talking about our data set and specifically sharing some kind of high-level learnings. And, and our researchers looked at things like um, lifestyle choices and how they affect your brain. And this is, you know, correlational analysis, looking at our users on, you know, how much, uh, how much do they sleep, how much, uh, what kind of eating habits do they have, how much do they exercise, things like that, and correlating that to their actual cognitive performance. And interestingly enough, a lot of the things we're hearing um, about you know, things you should do for your body are also exactly the things you should do for your brain. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, one uh, interesting data point that we saw was you know, sleep, for example. You know, getting enough sleep is really important, but at the same time, moderate amounts of sleep is better than excess amounts of sleep. So we were finding that seven hours of sleep was, um, was optimal for cognitive performance. Obviously, it's not a causal relationship. You know, there, there would have to be more work to determine that. But you know, interestingly, people who are sleeping nine hours were also doing worse uh, than people who are sleeping seven hours, and as were people who were uh, sleeping uh, five hours. Um, so that was an interesting data point. Uh, we found that um, people who uh, uh, another uh, alcohol was an interesting one as well. Uh, a lot, lo a lot like the uh, heart-related uh, research we have seen over the years. Um, having one drink a day was better than zero drinks a day, um, <laughs> and I was, I was also better than having you know three or four drinks a day. So I just wonder how many in the audience are thinking, oh, "This is great news." And how many thinking, <laughs> "Damn." <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, what I never know about the alcohol 
pieces. You know, it, it, maybe the people who, you know, in a very disciplined manner have just one drink every day, just have so much self-control that they, in <laughs> fact, you know, just have a better, more disciplined life outside of, uh, outside of that. That's hard, hard to know. Um, but, yeah, so there's some, you know, I think, but for us, this is really the beginning of a, of a journey. I mean, I think the brain is something that... Um, that obviously um, we know very little about. Um, you know, we know very little about it at a functional level, how it works, but we also know, you know, not a ton about it at a behavioral level. And what we have learned in the last decade is probably far in excess of what all of humanity knew as of 10 years ago. And what we'll learn in the next decade will probably dwarf everything we know today. And that's a really exciting place to be. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, as it and and a lot of our work and um, you know, obviously has to do with longevity because one of the key areas people start, you know thinking about and caring about their brain, especially is when they start noticing it performing a little bit worse uh, this year than it was performing the prior year. But it's also just about, you know, just being better at every life stage. You know, it's sort of like everybody wants, you know, uh, I find that my dad who's 74 uses our product, you know, isn't so focused on how he's going to be when he's 84. He's just focused on being the best he can be today. And you know, he wants to be better at things that he, he's finding himself uh, being uh, slightly worse at. So, but it's an exciting journey to start figuring that out. That's awesome. Yeah. I think I'm going to um, thank everybody on the panel and say that one of the interesting themes that's come across is all of you are talking about curiosity and education. And that that's so much a driver of people's improvements in lifestyle choices. And the idea of that link, that as long as we're curious and we want to make this change, I mean, it has to do, of course, with demographics and all that, but it's also uh, very hopeful for all of us who wish to be welderly forever. <laughs> um, so I will go get my plane. Thank you all great. very much. What a great conversation you're Thank having. You. Thanks, Corby. Thanks. <laughs> One of the themes that really interested me in this conference was just the idea of collaboration and the idea of you know all the things that can be gained from a really cross-disciplinary approach, um, you know, to wellness and to medicine and to data and all of that. And um, I'd love to hear you guys just talk a little bit about that idea and you know um, the Human Cognition Program, for example, and all the other work that you do. You know, where you see collaboration fitting in and what you would hope for the future. That's our day job in yeah. Cal IT2. So we are one minus <clears throat> the normal university. So if it gets done in departments, we don't do it. And what doesn't get done in departments is collaboration across departments and across uh, specialties, across with the community, with the firefighters, for instance, which we've done a lot with wildfires, things that ought to be done, but in this just rigid set of stovepipes don't get done. And one of the problems is that when you've got a culture that all of the um, measurements that uh, determine your promotion and so forth are based on, you know, did you do a single author paper in the good journals or if you was multi-author, was your name closer to the front than the end? I mean, this is just nuts. But this is how we're evaluated as professors. And so there's a deep cultural barrier to collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so it's not easy or else it would have spontaneously emerged. I often have a situation where there's a call for a proposal, requires a chemist, a mathematician, and someone from the medical school. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll, we both have a Rolodex, so we know how to go find folks who like to collaborate and who are really good. And then we bring them together, and then they go, we help them write the proposal. And they say, oh, thank goodness for Cal IT2. We never would have been able to do this. And I said, how long have each of you been here at UCSD? And they say, well, I've been here 15 years. I've been here 12 years. I've been here 20 years. And you couldn't find each other? Yeah. That's yeah. how big the potential barrier against collaboration is. And so it takes a special energy and, and mandate, actually, in mm -hmm. this case from Governor Davis and President Atkinson uh, of the University of California that started the program in 2000 to make it happen. But once you can do it, it's the floodgates open. The, mm -hmm. the amount of people that want to collaborate on projects in society that really matter, mm -hmm. it's just enormous. And that's what's so hopeful. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I'm, I'm really excited you asked this question because one of the things that I'm uh, most excited about what we're doing um, at LUMOS um, is um, collaborating with researchers at, at academic institutions. And, and it's always, you know, I'm, I come from a very academic family, and, and when I 
came out of college and decided not to go into academia and went into business, it just struck me that there was just this big divide. You know, it's almost like, you know, people, yeah, in academia will talk about the business world in this, you know, in a particular way, and people in the business world will talk about the academia. And it just you know, it didn't make any sense to me because, you know, when, especially in fields and in our field where we're learning things, you know, working in a collaborative way just seems so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and so the approach that we took um, and this is something I'm really proud of, is we sort of said, well, we're going to do our own research because that's important to you know, our core R&D, uh, but we're going to create those tools in an open platform way, and we're going to share those tools with all the <coughs> folks that we know in academia, and we're going to let them do the studies that they want to do. And it'll be, it'll be really exciting because we will be having an impact that is you know, potentially at a larger scale than had we stayed in academia. And so it felt like you know, having the best of both worlds. And over, yeah, over the last... Uh, Seven years now, um, we've built these tools, um, which we fund with our, you know, um, corporate efforts that help us from a business perspective. But then we also just share these tools. And today, there's about 45 different academic collaborations going mm -hmm. on on the Lumosity platform. And the really exciting thing here is that researchers who, you know, know oftentimes know something, you know, know a lot about something that we know nothing about, are are, are doing studies that we. Um, we wouldn't even have thought of. I mean, I want to just make it, to make it a little bit more concrete, and one very specific example is um, we're working with a couple of folks at Stanford, uh, Annette and Ahmed, um, who, who are interested in looking at generalized anxiety disorder, or looking at depression, mm -hmm. and what they found in their research was that a lot of the folks who suffer from those conditions have this particular cognitive deficit around task switching, around flexibility, where they seem to ruminate on you know, which leads them to ruin our negative thoughts too, hmm. too much. And so they, ha they hypothesized that maybe something like Lumosity, which helps with task switching training, could help this population. Now, that's something that we would never have thought of, and it's, you know, it's an interesting hypothesis. And so they were able to run a study that would have cost them you know, probably millions of dollars mm -hmm. um, if they built all the tools themselves you know, for in you know, a very cost-effective manner. And um, the results have been really interesting. Um, they were just presenting uh, them recently at a conference, and then um, and it's, there's a paper in the works now. And I think the entire Stanford freshman class. Uh, I think they introduced Lumosity as a train, you know, as a <laughs> uh, as an intervention. See, there's you know, freshman year is a tough tough time. I think <laughs> in a lot of people's lives. So to see what kind of uh, measures we can, uh, you know, actually m outcome measures we can. Uh, uh, detect. Um, but it's just, you know, it, it's exciting because once you start collaborating, the cool thing is you sort of don't know what will happen right, and the things right. that will happen are things nobody really expected to happen. That's sort of where real learning happens. Yeah, that's great. And you have um, a collaboration, especially from the policy perspective too, and you know, what, what maybe the connections that we can have with our government and, and all that. Uh, well, uh, that led up to the, uh, they asked was I going to talk about Wellness Warrior, and I said, well, I'd rather, you know, I'm going to talk about being 91 in fitness, but that you have brought up Wellness Warrior indirectly because that's what we do. We have work, uh, it's wellnesswarrior.org, and it's still in infancy, and wait about January, we'll have our new website, so wait a little while. <laughs> but anyhow, but it's there now, and it's pretty good. It's but very good, actually. I've been there. It's good. It'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be better. And that's, that's the fun of it, because it's my decade project for this decade. <laughs> uh, but it, actually, we're trying to connect and get collaboration going between all the wonderful nonprofits who work to provide, to protect, to prevent illness. They're there to see that you have safe air and safe water and safe food. And there are dozens of fabulous organizations, uh, Environmental <coughs> Working Group and National and Conservation League and all these things that most of you should be following. So we're going to, through Wellness Warrior, connect them all. So we're going right. to be re like a US News. We're going to present <laughs> what more or less their breakthrough is so that you could be very, you know, follow one and be able to find out what's going on in these people who are fighting to save your lives. And so there is so much good going on. And there's it's sort of it's like David and Goliath kind of thing because the whole system is not set to protect you uh, and prevent illness. And what we've been doing all these years is preventing and teaching people the responsibility, your term, my term, mm -hmm. of taking care of themselves. We know what to do. We just have to do it. Hmm. I think that's the insidious thing about our culture that I've 
learned. I have to say I've become quite radicalized <laughs> by thinking about my body and taking responsibility gradually for it, which I didn't used to do or think that way. But what you realize is that um, I was talking to some young high school kids. I said, look, you're living in a war zone. You are surrounded by toxic food, so-called food, uh, by all kinds of toxic things that we as a civilization decide to just throw in the air. Not just CO2, which we think is fine to just dump in everybody's air, but all of the endocrine disrupting chemicals that uh, we're constantly putting into our water, uh, all kinds of uh, things that when they get in your body uh, can be the epigenetic change that can lead to things like cancer and, and, and so forth. And, but in America, we've been lulled into this sense by advertising that all of this stuff is good for you that is destroying your body. I mean, you should not be eating toxic sugar. It spikes your glucose insulin system and over time will develop uh, insulin resistance and is one of the major things driving the obesity epidemic, which we're four decades into. I mean, take high fructose corn syrup. In 1970, the average American consumed one pound of it per year. The average American now consumes about 50 pounds a year because it's in all processed foods and it's invisible. So it's not enough to get on the scale, do your elliptical, go for a run, you know, eat organic foods. That's a good start. But, but you have to learn that when, I, I told the kids, when something's advertised to you, these people are not your friends. <laughs> <coughs> They may have smiley little dancing things, <laughs> you know, polar bears sucking down stuff, but they're trying to get your money. And if somebody's coming up to you to try to get your money, don't get mugged. <laughs> okay? Stand up for yourself. Think. Read labels. Educate yourself. And that's what the journey I've been through for the last 10 years, going from, you know, looking like a normal American, which is overweight or obese, to much healthier, and but it but it's hard to think about just how wrong our current culture is in this regard, and what it's going to take to actually get it back to the sort of healthy environment that you've been a pioneer in for seventy years. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Um, let me know if you have questions, and we've got one in the back right there. Uh, good morning. I think it's still morning still. My name is Wyvern Oswat, and I'm a student at the UCSD post Back Extension Program. And this is a question, well, I just want to begin really saying that uh, I was really uh, hardened, really, to hear, hear your story just about how when you kind of first began, um, and this is for you, Miss De Miss. P Yes, Deborah. Um, when you just went out and, and began organic farming as a younger woman, uh, because it really does show a time when doing things like eating organic was simple and not so expensive. But now in our current um, kind of market sense, you know, it's almost though we're combating big agro with big orgo, if you will. Um, so can all three of you really talk to us a little bit just about those of us who are interested in empowering individuals and communities to live well and eat well, but doing so without such high costs. If you can give us any insight that you all have on that, that would be very appreciated. Thanks. Well, the answer is community gardens, <laughs> and they can be in sidewalks, they can be any place. People always, for aeons, grew their own food, and there's no reason why not we cannot, uh, in farmers markets, uh, and community gardens. Uh, at one time, you know, somebody had more tomatoes and someone had more squash and they would barter, I'll, you know, I'll give you some taters and will you give me some <laughs> of yours? I mean, we really have to go back to some of our agricultural roots to have abundant, inexpensive, relatively inexpensive natural foods. I mean, gardening is the answer, community gardens and farmers markets. Um, we, the freshness is very important, and most of the things in supermarkets don't have that fresh aliveness that is so important as food that you pick yourself. I grew up growing 
with my two brothers <clears throat> under my father's dutiful watch, uh, <clears throat> a half acre garden of um, Missouri River black soil that was like 20 feet deep or something. And <clears throat> we just had this bountiful, bountiful harvest. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much a half acre garden produces. It's just crazy. Uh, we would get gunny sacks of potatoes, of corn, of tomatoes. I mean, just, just rick, we just rick up the watermelons. I mean, I remember it got to the angle like they were all going to fall down, you know. <laughs> and, and I don't know how we actually ate all of that. But then we did, of course, give it to our friends and neighbors and that sort of thing. And then I went into this civilization and I, you know, I went <laughs> to, you know, sorry, University of Texas at Austin, Princeton, Harvard, Illinois and so forth, and somehow got outside of that. Fortunately, like here in La Jolla, we buy everything now, my wife and I, and we didn't used to do this. Uh, we gradually came to it, but everything we eat is made from scratch, organically, locally grown. If it is fish, it's wild caught. If it is uh, meat, uh, it is uh, grass-fed, no antibiotics, uh, no growth hormones, and so forth. And on the one hand, it may be a little more expensive than the government-subsidized toxic environment of corn, wheat, et cetera, sugar. Um, but there's, that's why it's cheap. If the government got out of it and stopped subsidizing the stuff you shouldn't be eating, things would relatively adjust in price so that natural food would actually be relatively inexpensive. But think about what one day in the hospital costs. Thousands of dollars. You don't want your body to get near a hospital. <laughs> hospital acquired infections are now killing more people than all the guns in this country combined with all the automobile crashes in this country. So you want to stay healthy, and if it costs a little bit more to have organic food, creating food, cooking with your own hands, taking the time to be with each other in the kitchen, also gets at some of the things that Ramesh was saying. I'm going to start wearing one of his bliss watches, <laughs> and I think that when I'm cooking, I am going to get it bzz, 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 <laughs> bliss moments. Yeah, those are uh, those are great points. I don't know if I have a ton to add. I think uh, the important thing is just, uh, I think the cost structures now are both a function of the policy decisions that are being made and a function of um, the consumer decisions that are being made. So I think just uh, those things will shift over time, and we have seen them shift over the last last decade, and I think a lot will change in the next, uh, next 10 years. Um, yeah, the garden thing is just, uh, I've always lived in cities. Um, and, but my parents recently moved uh, moved nearby, and they have a small you know, suburban home. And my mom planted, you know, a few tomato plants, and I was just blown away this year by how many tomatoes just like <laughs> five tomato plants yield. And just every time I go home, that she's just trying to hand over a bunch of tomatoes <laughs> to me. Uh, so that was a, that was just kind of a. So I don't know what you can do with half an acre, but it seems like more than more than a few people can eat for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And then I think we've got one over there. Hi, we've seen what has happened in 150 years of experimentation with our food. And now, as Deborah so uh, rightly pointed us back to our roots, I'm not suggesting something like a non smoking um, for technology, but it does seem like since we're running into this technology experiment, we should embrace areas of non technology, whether it's a Waldorf school or uh, Amish community. We need these alternatives to compare down the road. If we all just jump off the cliff with technology, we might find ourselves lemmings at the bottom of the cliff. Now, I know there are some people that even are looking into, besides the adulteration of our foods, uh, sleeping areas. In the past, people slept well, but they didn't have electrical outlets coming into their homes. So even if we do gradual changes of awareness, perhaps one room in the house that only is serviced with candlelight, um, I think we'll have more comparisons down the road 
than we would if we just all take the same path. And I wanted to see if there's any, any comment or any suggestions. Well, I think, you know, when I'm on my highly technical elliptical, looking mm -hmm. out over the Pacific Ocean, and I'm 40 minutes of exercise meditation effectively, I'm using technology deeply. I've got a heart rate monitor on to my smartphone that I have, I'm painting with my heart uh, intervals that I want to go between this many beats per minute and that many beats per minute for this many minutes. When I'm wearing my Fitbit, everybody who gets one of these little Fitbits, which is pretty high tech and also connected to the cloud and all that's very high tech, they double or triple the amount of walking that they do a day. And that is one of the biggest things you can do to improve your health in the long run, including your brain, <laughs> which is a part of your body. Uh, so I think it's not that technology is the enemy. Um, one of the, it's, it's basically been the problem since we had the river valleys and hunter-gatherers gave way to cultivated um, crops and domesticated animals and the population density jumped a huge amount and and the health right then we're talking five to ten thousand years ago went way down the height went down the teeth started, started rotting and falling out but you could keep a lot more people alive but it was on these empty calories basically of high glycemic uh, grains and um, and 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 that's still what has kept the world's population as large as it is. So I think we're going to actually see by the end of this century is a declining global population and a gradual re-emergence of healthier living. And, and it, when you have a market that's based on how many grains of whatever per acre is the metric, then of course it's going to end up not being as healthy as it could. Um, and that's why you're seeing one of the, fa I mean, the fastest growing area of the beef industry, maybe you don't want to eat meat, but if you do, is grass-fed. So I think there's some very hopeful trends out there, and I don't think you have to run away from technology, but you do have to think about it and make it your, make it serve the goals that you personally have and not just be a slave to it. Okay, great, and I think we have time for one more question. Uh, let's go to the back over there. Oh. Hi, Andrea Mills. I, I have two very simple and complex questions at, at the same time uh, as possible interventions. So, so first, why the FDA doesn't really ban completely all, all processed foods and, and really take care of the other equation of the healthcare? And second of all, why uh, um, are we not seeing a, a big push against decentralization of, of knowledge workers in, uh, in, uh, in, in rural areas, in high quality environments, They're using telework at a, at a very high and high quality level with the level of technology that we have, instead of being uh, always forced to move to the big cities, to New York, to Silicon Valley and all that. Because uh, uh, that will actually empower easier to execute the strategies also at family level to do to don't spend three hours in a car, to get your own garden without spending a million dollars in, in a piece of land that is polluted in the back door, and stuff like that. So I wonder why these things are not happening in, the, in this big scenario of evolution. Thanks. Well, we're in a moment of churn, as they say. When you, go, when you have something really disruptive happen, it, there's a moment that can go on for decades in which both positive and negative things are happening at the same time and, and all over the place. So you see Yahoo telling, which was a distributed work company, that everybody's got to come back and be inside of uh, the Yahoo complex. Um, on the other hand, my assistant, uh, Kristen Johnson, has been virtual for six years. And she's lived various places, now lives out actually in El Cajon, was up in the Bay Area, three different places. She's on Skype eight hours a day. She, she reads my email, does my calendar. We, you know, I can't tell that she's not physically there. So there, there's plenty of both things happening. 
But I think you're right that in the fullness of time, you know, and, um, Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, wrote um, a uh, book back in Naked Sun, back in 54 or something like that, 1954. When, and, and in that world, people actually, there were a small number of people, and seeing another person was very socially uh, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw three-dimensional holograms and interacted that way. Um, and that was the way the whole society on Earth was organized. Mm -hmm. So there's been metaphors that artists, among other social scientists, have provided. Um, and I think this call for more experiments, you know, I think is, is, is exactly right. We, we need more examples that we can learn from and uh, emulate. I'd like to just say, um, again, and it is the individuals, we need to empower the individuals, empower our people to understand how much damage is being done by big business, big agro, big pharma, big, all this bigness. Um, all our food is uh, in the hands of less than 20 major corporations. Each one has dozens and dozens of companies. Uh, all our beef uh, is grown by under 10 people, 10 corporations. 80% of the beef produced in the United States is produced by 10 corporations. And something like 90% of the pork is produced by like six corporations. I mean, they, they have different names. They have long lists of names that people. The system has become big business. And if we can get food out of big business <laughs> and back into the hands of the people, we'll be way ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you guys very much. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you.